Good evening, everyone. My name is Ellie Weisenberg Kelly, and I'm the manager of public programs at the Pecanico Center of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. On behalf of everyone at the RBF, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's 2021 Spring Forum, Renee Darnancourt and the Art of Installation with Michelle Elligott, Chief of Archives, Library and Research Collections at the Museum of Modern Art, and moderated by Katrina London, Manager of Collections and Curatorial Projects at the Pecanico Center. Once home to the Rockefeller family, the Pecanico Center's verdant campus in the scenic hills of the Hudson Valley has been host to some of the most influential leaders, thinkers, and creative minds of the last century. Today, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund continues to bring together people at Picantico through a robust slate of conferences, artist residencies, tours, performances, and educational programs. While Picantico is currently closed due to, the, due to the pandemic, we are so happy to be able to connect with audiences from all over the world through our virtual platforms. Please feel free to use the chat to let us know where you're joining us from. You can also visit our website at rbf.org slash events to sign up for our mailing list and check out our upcoming programs. Before we begin tonight's program, we'd like to honor the legacy of the indigenous people of Picantico, the unceded ancestral territory of the Lenape, past, present, and future, in gratitude and appreciation and in recognition of their displacement and dispossession. Now, before I turn things over to Katrina to introduce herself and Michelle, I'd like to acknowledge the following RBF colleagues for helping to make tonight's event possible. Judy Clark, Executive Director of the Picantico Center, Regina Cregan, Director of Conferences and Administration, and Ari Klickstein, Communications Associate and Digital Specialist. We'd also like to thank Jess Ronestage at Benchicom for her technical assistance. Now, Katrina has some great questions for Michelle, and she's incorporated some of the questions that some of you have submitted ahead of time. Thanks for that. Please feel free to use the Q&A box to post questions during the presentation. And if we run out of time, we'll do our best to get back to you afterwards. And you can also use the upvote or the like thumbs up function if you see a question you'd like answered. And just a final note, we are recording today's Q&A and we'll be posting it online soon and we'll let you know when it's available. And with that, it's my pleasure to turn things over to our moderator for the evening, Katrina London. Thank you so much, Ellie. Hi, everyone. I'm Katrina London. I'm the manager of collections and curatorial projects at the Pecanico Center. And my role focuses on the preservation and curation of Kaikit's collections of decorative and fine art. And some of you may know that in the 1960s and 70s, Nelson Rockefeller added a significant collection of modern art to the house and grounds. And one of his most trusted art advisors was Rene Darnancourt, a great friend, colleague, and collaborator. Between 1962 and 1968, Nelson consulted with Darnancourt on art installations at Kaikit, including Picasso's 1956 sculptural group, The Bathers. A testament to Darnancourt's brilliant hand and eye, these beautifully installed bronzes remain in situ today. And I'm so delighted to welcome uh, and introduce tonight's Spring Forum speaker, Michelle De Elligott, who will share insights on Darnancourt and his visionary work. Ms. Elligott is Chief of Archives, Library and Research Collections at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. The publication she will be discussing tonight, Renee Darnancourt and the Art of Installation, was featured on the New York Times Best Art Books list in 2018, and it earned the Arts Library Society of North America Worldwide Books Award in 2019. Her latest book, Modern Artifacts, appeared on the Best Art Books of 2020 list of the New York Times, LA Times, and, the New, York, and New York Magazine. Ms. Elligott was part of the curatorial team for the newly reimagined MoMA collection reinstallation in 2019, which many of you may have seen if you're here in New York. In 2017, she curated the exhibition Devenir Moderne, part of the museum's exhibition Etre Moderne at the Fondation Louis Vuitton in Paris. She also co-directed MoMA's widely acclaimed exhibition history web archive project and co-edited the institution's first self-published history, Art, of Art, Art in Our Time, a Chronicle of the Museum of Modern Art. We're so honored to have you here with us tonight, Michelle. Thank you so much. And now I'll leave it to you. 
Thank you very, very much. I'm going to pull up my slides here. Great. And Katrina, are the slides working properly? Great, thank you. So good evening, everyone. Uh, before I begin, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to Ellie Weisenberg Kelly and Katrina London of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund for the invitation to speak with you and for their warm welcome here this evening. I'm also grateful to Jack Myers, president of the Rockefeller Archive Center for planting the seed of the idea to present this talk in this forum. It is more than appropriate, sorry, I have to turn off my phone. I think the subject for tonight is more than appropriate, um, I believe, and not just because of the great relationship between Nelson Rockefeller and Rene Darnancourt. But what most of you probably do not know is that some 20 years ago, MoMA and the Rockefeller Archive Center collaborated on the project to process the Darnancourt papers. The collection actually lived temporarily at Rack in Sleepy Hollow for over a year, and I made monthly visits uh, from the city to supervise the work there. So I feel like this is a very nice celebration of the long relationship between our two institutions and really families. Finally, I am indebted to MoMA Archives Fellow for Research and Reference, Christina Eliopoulos, for her considerable assistance on all aspects of this project and for sharing with me the enthusiasm, indeed, frankly, the mission, to impart to the world the story of one of the great museum personalities of the last century. So let's dive right in. René Darnancourt was a unique specimen, artist, collector, curator, then director of the Museum of Modern Art for two decades. He was a man of many talents, an autodidact who rather than follow the narrow path of a classically trained art historian, and I personally think this part is key, he learned from a diverse set of experiences and direct contact with works of art and their makers in their original environments. He had an insatiable interest in and curiosity about the arts and a respect for and delight in working with living artists. This genial, amiable man who stood at six feet six inches and 230 pounds garnered the nickname, the gentle giant. In his role at MoMA, equal parts museum director, art amateur and advocate, he was, as his daughter Anne Darnancourt, who was herself a legendary museum director at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, remarked, so outgoing, so charming, so ebullient, so persuasive. His seemingly boundless optimism and open-mindedness, combined with it being a humanist, polymath, and polyglot, becoming fluent in six languages, not to mention his legendarily wonderful sense of humor, made him an ideal museum administrator, diplomat, artist, and advocate for the arts. Among his numerous talents, there was one particular activity in which he excelled and truly delighted, the design and installation of museum exhibitions. He was an innovator in the field. He once said, installation is terribly dangerous. It's full of terribly seductive temptations. In his approach, he privileged direct observation of the art object and its context, and he sought to bring forth affinities between artworks from cultures and eras near and far. He also learned, if you will, the artworks by sketching them, as we will see, and revolutionized installation de design by thinking deeply about the visitor's experience of the art on display carefully considering every aspect of its presentation and devising his own methodology to do so. In my talk today, I will discuss Darnancourt's unique approach to the design of exhibitions and his methodology. I will also outline in broad strokes some of the more interesting points in the biography of this Renaissance man and discuss the many intersecting interests of he and Nelson. Finally, I will highlight just a few of his more ravishing displays, and I hope this gouache rendering done in his own hand of one of his installations will serve as a teaser and uh, keep you interested throughout uh, the course of our lecture tonight. Darnancourt's process began with single object studies, 
His curatorial practice was absolutely predicated on firsthand observation of the works and object-rooted connoisseurship. This foundational first step was usually the longest part of the process for Darnancourt, sometimes occupying him for up to an entire year. Now drawing was basically Darnancourt's means of absorbing information. By making individual line drawings of each item in the show, he came to learn and to know each object. As he himself explained, a drawing forces you to concentrate on all the details. When you make a drawing of an object, you really understand it. Darnancourt, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Darnancourt underplayed his astonishing powers of recall humbly describing his drawings as simply a means of trying to find out about things. But we know better through anecdotes um, that we've, we can learn that he was able to conjure sketches of dozens of items he had viewed in a session earlier in a given day. In fact, even Nelson Rockefeller once recalled going to a viewing with Darnancourt um, to see a collection of some 7,000 items during a trip to the West Coast in the 1950s from which Nelson purchased 70 works. Rockefeller recounted that on the flight home, Darnancourt drew a picture of each one of those 70 objects from, from memory. And we discussed them as though we were setting up a show in relation to the rest of the collection. Once Darnancourt had mastered all the objects to be included in the exhibition, he would begin studying how to group them. He would render the objects to scale on a single sheet of paper so that he could understand the relative size and proportion of one work to the rest, often noting the dimension of the objects beneath the drawing itself. An understanding of the relative size of the works is of course critical in designing a display to project and anticipate their overall impact in the gallery spaces. Having drawn each of the objects selected for inclusion in an exhibition, Darnacore would begin to group them together using different means of organizing each exhibition according to its thesis. They could be geographical, chronological, or formal. Then Darnancourt, quote, tried to relate the individual pieces to their cultural and or artistic neighbors. In other words, to assemble objects that had some affinities. Darnancourt would then consider the space. Analyze the ground plan of the galleries and roughly place the groupings in the various spaces, very conscious all the time of the visitor's experience in those spaces. He said, you have to allow for the traffic and what people can see when other people are around them, he explained. Darnancourt's diagrams of the visitor's intended movements through the galleries could become highly elaborated. He sketched floor plans, um, his sketched floor plans rather, would include notations of the various stylistic sections of the exhibition, such as you see here, Hellenistic, neoclassic, folk art. And sometimes these floor plans even embedded miniature drawings of many of the works of art in their respective locations. He thought of how to direct the visitor in a meaningful and determined order to circulate most effectively to achieve the desired effect. Darnancourt elaborated on the basic two-dimensional floor plan by introducing the idea of what he called vistas, employed as a manner of creating a progressive sequential movement. He possessed an uncanny ability to project himself into the space of the exhibition. Today, of course, you know, these renderings would be done with digital tools that allow designers to visualize the visitor experience in 3D. You know, from scale models, we've now moved on to Photoshop, AutoCAD, SketchUp, et cetera. But Darnancourt had to turn to his drawing pad. And this is perhaps my favorite um, example of these vistas, a simple you know, sheet of ruled notebook paper. And you see the brown, the little brown squares, that's obviously, that's the, the browning of old scotch tape. So he's designed what the vista would look like when you enter the gallery. And then with the tape, you could flip open those extra pieces of paper to see as the viewer, once you were to pass those columns or piers, what the gallery would look like as you're actually moving through space. 
Treating each section of an exhibition separately, he drew perspectives of the objects in that section to understand each item's exact placement, its relation to other works within the section, and perhaps most importantly, its relation and communication to neighboring objects in other sections. He developed these installation vistas with great care and exactitude, um, and in many cases, keying the ground plan with the vista identifiers. And I like this drawing. You can see at the bottom, he actually has sort of the circulation plan. Um, and over here, he's uh, included a, a drawing of a viewer in the galleries. Vistas were employed by Darnancourt not only as a manner of creating a progressive sequential movement, he also thought deeply about the notion of open vistas, which he saw as a means of drawing connections between distinct, geographically or otherwise, groups to emphasize interrelationships. Now, Darnacor was also not shy about altering the interior spaces of the galleries of the museum, and in fact, completely changed their size and shape on many occasions to create, quote, that feeling of interlocking so the visitor could make comparisons, uh, not just with, within sections, but as he moved from one section to another. He would transform spaces using modular galleries, movable, removable, or staggered walls. And he also developed new methods of reconfiguring a space, such as replacing full height walls with mid height partitions and double sided counter height open vitrines, which were useful in creating vistas in that they could be designed in such a way as to stand on the borderline of the cultural areas, he explained. These novel unenclosed cabinets, which you can see at the lower left, invited a more engaging and direct contemplation of the work and allowed objects within to function as linkages between the various galleries. That fan, you would see it um, from two separate galleries representing sort of the connection in between the two uh, formal um, and the two different cultural uh, areas. In addition to physical spaces and carefully arranged groupings of objects, Darnancourt recognized the power of wall color and lighting to influence the impression of an exhibition. And I love this color wheel. You can see here him studying how he's going to deploy color in one of his exhibitions. In exhibits of native arts, Darnancourt employed color to suggest the various topographic environments of the creators. Yellow, as you see here, evoked areas with sandy beaches and deep green for those who inhabited the jungle, for instance. For exhibits of modern art, Darnancourt carefully selected color to provide a backdrop that would complement the works while also allowing them to stand out. His preparation notes for sculpture of Picasso, for instance, indicate that he selected a specific shade for each individual wall of each room. Dark warm gray, brick red, light blue gray, and he would even select fabric swatches, indicating the exact hue of the custom made curtains that he wanted, which he would affix to his planning notes and send off for fabrication. And here you can see another example of a dramatic and bold color employed in his Timeless Aspects show. In a similar way, Darnancourt exploited the possibilities of light, taking the cue from theatrical lighting design. Given his intimate knowledge of both the formal properties of the work learned through sketching and its context acquired through careful study, he was able to employ the subtleties of dramatic lighting to great effect. Darnancourt would often strive to illuminate the objects included in a manner that would evoke their original context. Native American masks used during ceremonies performed around campfires were presented in a semi-darkened room, displayed in niches lit from below, for example. Or a Spanish Romanesque medieval cross that would have originally been lit by candlelight from below in a darkened church or cathedral was lit in this case in the galleries also dramatically from below. He also came up with sort of novel devices for displaying works. And what you're seeing here on this large sort of table or plinth um, 
in those little recesses, what's contained within there are graphite drawings by Seurat on paper, and they're actually lit from underneath. So it's like a giant light box in the center of the gallery. I can't imagine our conservators allowing us to get uh, away with that today. Darnancourt's innovative exhibition devices could also be extremely subtle. When he revealed to an interviewer that 20,000 pounds of bricks were required to create the pedestals used in sculpture of Picasso, his final and most complex installation at MoMA, his interlocutor admitted it that he hadn't noticed the bricks. Darnancourt was delighted, declaring that was proof of the, their perfection in the installation. Or dramatic, such as this purpose built pavilion in the museum garden for the art of the Asmat show, with its canvas walls and earthen floor, meant to be evocative of an Asmat home. So, how did Darnancourt come to develop such a radical and singular vision for exhibition design? To understand that, I believe you have to understand something about the life of this great man. This gentle giant had a fascinating life story filled with colorful tales that did not necessarily preordain the conclusion of becoming the director of the Museum of Modern Art. He was born a count in Austria in 1901 and enjoyed an enviable upbringing by any accounts, including having a governess when young and in his teens collecting old master prints, including a Durer, as well as you know, just what any teenager would do, befriending the poet Rilke. He went on to study chemistry at university in Vienna, writing a thesis on, just get this, the details here, the creosote contents of certain soft coals in Yugoslavia. In 1924, Darnancourt's comfortable life was abruptly upended. With the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the family estate he was set to inherit was expropriated to Czechoslovakia. So seeing few opportunities at home, he decided it would be better to be poor in a new land than in familiar territory. And so he set sail for the new world in 1925, arriving nearly penniless in Mexico City in January of 1926. And I'm showing you his immigration card from a few years later. It is, uh, I think, important to note at, at this point that Darnacore would have preferred to come to the United States at that time. However, the Restrictive Immigration Act of 1924 unfortunately made that impossible. It didn't seem to have occurred to the happy-go-lucky Darnancourt that it just might be difficult for an Austrian nobleman who didn't speak Spanish or for that matter, even English to find employment as a scientist in Mexico. But the ever resourceful Darnancourt picked up odd jobs such as sketching portraits and bullfights to sell to tourists, painting watch faces, decorating shop windows, and illustrating children's books, um, including the one you see here. And this is one of my favorite uh, pages because what you're seeing on the right is basically Darnancourt uh, in a self-portrait representing himself. He would often just you know, sit in the town square and, and, and draw from nature and, and sell this as tourist art. And he also did other children's books such as this, The Painted Pig. He also scoured the country procuring and then selling to wealthy collectors the finest examples of indigenous Mexican arts, all the while becoming a foremost expert on the subject. And finally, it was a heady time in Mexico City and he fell in with the circle of Mexican modernists. He was close to Tina Medodi and Miguel Covarrubias from whom he learned a great deal about native art and artists. I'm showing you on the left, uh, part of Tina Madotti's uh, famous series of marionettes. She would make marionettes. This is her portrait of Darnancourt as a puppet um, that she would then photograph. And on the right, Cova Rubius's caricature of Darnancourt. And in 1927, Darnancourt organized the first commercial exhibition in Mexico of Diego Rivera, 
Jose Clemente Orozco and Rufino Tamayo at Fred Davis's Sonora News Company. Now, one of his clients um, while he was there was the US ambassador to Mexico, Dwight Morrow, and his wife, Elizabeth. This was to become a prodigious relationship. Darnancourt painted this mural that you see here of Cuernavaca for the Morrow's home. Elizabeth would be an important collaborator on his children's book projects, such as The Painted Pig that we just saw. And in 1929, Darnancourt was commissioned to curate his first large scale exhibition. Aspiring to improve the popular conception of Mexico among Americans, Ambassador Moro approached the Mexican government to cooperate on the organization of an exhibition on the country's native art for circulation in the United States. Moro then tasked Darnancourt with organizing the exhibition titled Mexican Arts, from finding and selecting the objects to determining the layout, um, their layout in the various venues to which the exhibition would travel. Thus, Darnancourt spent the year of 1930 traveling extensively throughout Mexico, assembling over 1,200 items of, quote, of Mexican arts, not arts in Mexico. He was concerned with the presentation only of such works of art as are an expression of Mexican civilization. The exhibition was arranged into three thematic groupings, popular art, colonial, colonial era decorative art, and modern art, which you see at the bottom right. It opened at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City in October of 1930. And these are installation views from the Met showing. And it, it received such popular acclaim and with the success of this initial presentation, the organizing American Federation of Arts um, in, uh, organization decided to add six additional venues to the original eight. And this provided Darnancourt the opportunity for the first time to embark on travels across the United States. And I just adore this photo of Darnancourt looking so dapper in his white suit um, with his installation of this exhibition at the Speed Museum in Louisville, Kentucky. And I should also note, this is very important, it's on this tour um, throughout the United States that he meets his future wife and was later able to obtain an immigration visa, get married and settle in the United States. Largely due to the success with the Mexican arts exhibition, <clears throat> in 1936, Darnancourt was offered the position of assistant manager of the US Indian Arts and Crafts Board or the IACB and he was promoted to general manager a year later, a position he would hold until 1944. The IACB asked Darnancourt to assemble and install an ambitious exhibition of Native American arts. And in 1939, Indian art in the United States and Alaska opened at the San Francisco Golden Gate International Exhibition. Like the IACB itself, the exhibition aimed to convey an explicitly commercial message. Um, and you might see at the bottom right of the plan, these uh, two model rooms. And this is one of Darnancourt's drawings for that model room. The idea was to create a stable revenue source for craftsmen to give Native American artists and artisans a chance to find new market for their products. And so basically what they're showing here is ways to incorporate Native American um, objects within modern living. Two years later, Darnancourt reprised this subject at MoMA in the exhibition, Indian Art of the United States. Comprising over 1000 items, the exhibition had an innovative approach for its display. Progressing chronologically, but reversing the usual traffic pattern, the show opened on the top floor with the prehistoric section prior to European colonization with displays of membrous pottery and reproductions of historic Pueblo mural paintings that were actually executed by contemporary Hopi painter Fred Cabote, who you see here on the left at the opening with Eleanor Roosevelt.
This was followed on the second floor with living traditions of historic and contemporary native art, including this presentation of Navajo ponchos, which evoked human proportions and the sky and, and lands of the plains, yet was an abstracted one, as well as live events featuring Navajo sand painters. The show ended on the ground floor with Indian art for modern living, a selection of contemporary objects recontextualized as art for the body or for the home in the modern world and included uh, this elegant, what you see here, this elegant opre ski suit, which incorporated traditional Indian textiles designed by Swiss fashion designer, Fred Picard. The 1940 Indian art exhibition was a game changer for Darnacore. And why is that, do you ask? Well, I'll tell you. For it provided the moment of introduction to one Nelson A. Rockefeller, then the influential president of MoMA's Board of Trustees. From here on out, the course of Dar Darnancourt's life would be forever intertwined with that of Nelson's. Indeed, later that same year, Rockefeller hired Darnancourt to work for him first as advisor and later in 1943 as acting director of the arts section of the Office of the Coordinator of Inter-American Affairs, Department of State. Quite, quite a long title there. And by 1944, at Rockefeller's instigation, two new positions were created at MoMA specifically for Darnancourt vice president in charge of foreign activities, overseeing the museum's relations with Latin America, a pet project obviously near and dear to Nelson, and director of the Department of Manual Industry. A few years later in 1946, Darnancourt organized his first MoMA exhibition as a member of staff, Arts of the South Seas. Throughout his career, Darnancourt would be known first and for, foremost for his exhibitions of what was then called primitive or what we now would refer to as non-Western art. In later years, he was known, uh, quote, not only as the museum's director, but its chief ethnological expert. Arts of the South Seas was a presentation of some, according to the press release, quote, 400 strange and fantastic objects from four oceanic regions of Australia, Melanesia, Micronesia, and Polynesia, broken down into 20 distinct cultural areas. Darnakor wanted to impress upon the viewer that the specificity of culture, geography, climate, and natural resources impacted the work that was produced. So he sought to suggest these differences as well as to draw connections across the areas. Furthermore, analyzing the relationship of the art of the South Seas to modern art, he identified some shared formal affinities. Both drastically um, simplify form. The treatment of the human figure is stylized rather than realis realistic and distortion is employed for emphasis. This idea of affinity or that the works were shown for their aesthetic rather than ethnographic value served according to Darnancourt, quote, to act as a reminder that such modern means of expression as exaggeration, distortion, and abstraction have been used by artists since the very beginning of civilization. With Nelson, who you see here on the left visiting the Arts of the South Seas exhibition, he shared a passion for indigenous arts, an interest they would both mutually cultivate over the coming decades. From 1949 onwards, Darnancourt advised Nelson on the building of his collection of primitive art. And what I'm showing you now are pages from two notebooks um, that Darnancourt assembled and, and titled Collection and Desiderata um, for Nelson Rockefeller's collection, um, this for Arts of the South Seas, and this one for his notebook relating to building the collection of art from Africa. Um, these items are actually 
owned by the Metropolitan Museum of Art and they've, they have some nice resources on their web. If you'd like to learn more, you can find them there. Darnancourt would go on to curate and, and install two more exhibitions of indigenous art during his tenure at the museum. Oh, I was just gonna show you this to remind us all, I think they had a lot of fun when they were working to build this collection. Um, and I like these photos where you can kind of see the connection between the two of them, their laughter and, and, and jovial spirit. So as I was remarking, Darnancourt did, uh, continued to do a few other uh, non-Western art exhibitions, including this 1954 show, Ancient Art of the Andes, as well as this one, Art of the Azmat, the collection of Michael C. Rockefeller in 1962. This exhibition was of course a touching tribute to the works assembled by Nelson's son during his two research ex expeditions to New Guinea the second of which tragically ended with the disappearance of the young Rockefeller. The culmination of their work together on non-Western art was the co-founding in 1956 of the Museum of Primitive Art, located at 15 West 54th Street, directly opposite the museum's Abbey Aldrich Rockefeller Sculpture Garden, with Darnancourt as vice president. It was the fulfillment of a lifelong dream for the two of them. According to Darnancourt, the mission of the institution was to be dedicated to the aesthetic aspects of the indigenous arts of the two Americas, Oceania and Africa, and to the corresponding early phases of European and Asiatic civilizations. We have no intention to rival or duplicate the works the work of museums of anthropology or archaeology, but we hope to supplement it. By showing only objects of greatest artistic value, we hope to open to the public new sources for aesthetic enjoyment and at the same time to focus its attention on the merits of civilizations other than ours. And Darnancourt installed the museum's inaugural show. So now turning back to MoMA, in October of 1949, the Board of Trustees unanimously uh, elected Darnancourt director of the museum. Over the ensuing two decades, Darnancourt was a very able administrator and diplomat guiding the museum through a period of growth and success. Even if on occasion he found the meeting somewhat tedious and uh, was drawn to doodle all over the agendas for said meetings. During that same time, he regularly continued his practice of organizing and installing exhibitions, something I think one really can't imagine from an active museum director today. In addition to the category of indigenous art shows, he arranged exhibitions of two other genres, the first of which we can think of as didactic and educational. And in 1948-49, Darnancourt organized a pair of companion shows to celebrate the museum's 20th anniversary. The goal of timeless aspects of modern art was to show the affinities between the world heritage of art or the idea of aligning cultural objects that may be quite different in terms of their meaning or function in their culturally specific context and aligning them according to their visual form. Timeless aspects brought together modern art with work from other eras and cultures, but not to trace influences, derivations, or traditions. Rather, the intention was to present Darnancourt's conception of affinity. In his own words, quote, their affinity may be based on the artist's physical pleasure in certain rhythmic movements, on their fascination with clean cut mathematical order, on their desire to perceive and render the inner structure of things, on religious emotion and many other factors. In the section dedicated to volume and form, Darnancourt made an elegant juxtaposition of Constantin Bragcusi's bird in space with an ancient fertility symbol. In the section devoted to stylization and emotional content, uh, he paired the Spanish crucifix that we had seen er previously with a painting of Christ by modern painter Georges Rouault. 
With modern art in your life, which opened a year later, Darnancourt once again set out to demonstrate the existence of affinities across art forms, focusing on the importance of modern fine arts by illustrating how they had informed the design of everyday items that you would find in your day-to-day -day life. For example, surrealist paintings by Salvador Dali and Yves Tanguy here, you see them flanking the entrance to a dramatically darkened gallery containing spotlit three-dimensional tableaus, which in reality were actually examples of contemporary department store window design. The last of the three exhibition genres which Darnancourt investigated was the monographic show, a series of some half dozen of which he mounted. Now these allowed him to refine his thinking on installation and in most cases to actually move away from the more dramatic register of his earlier displays uh, towards more subtle installations. Additionally, and again, I think this point here is key to understand that with only one exception, in these cases, Darnancourt was not the curator of the show. There was someone else who was curator, but rather he was invited simply to lead the installation design efforts. Um, also with these monographic shows, I think it's quite interesting to note that he tended to gravitate towards sculpture shows. And I think one could argue that this probably comes from his well-refined uh, specialization and all of his experience dealing with three-dimensional native art and artifacts. So briefly, let's just look at two examples beginning with this utterly beautiful retrospective of Jean Art from 1958, which presented Darnancourt with a number of challenges, uh, including a career's worth of work with little stylistic evolution over time, as well as an abundance of small scale items. Darnancourt responded with a novel layout with piers and wing-like canvas structures, punctuating and defining the individual viewing spaces and employing a suite of neutral and contrasting wall tones. Indeed, Arp himself, the artist who you see here on the right with Darnancourt, noted to museum trustee James Thrall Sobey a bit wistfully while walking through the show, quote, I know that my work will never again look this well. The culminating masterwork of Darnancourt's distinguished career was the 1967 Sculpture Picasso exhibition. Unlike the two earlier venues in Paris and London where the works were arranged chronologically, Darnancourt organized the New York iteration into complementary groupings, emphasizing aggregations by affinity of form and content. For this, his final installation, Darnancourt implied a variety of novel techniques, and I've already mentioned those brick pedestals, which were topped with pebbles, and he cleaned up the ceiling here in the lobby. Later in the show, when he was trying to determine how to exhibit the monumental heads, he designed a round room because he wanted to give the effect of infinite space. And, you know, sometimes works are not available. And in this case, when presented with that, uh, he used other devices. So when he wanted to include the um, flat metal panel of the bathers, which you see in this area here, um, which uh, they were not available. These works were to come into the collection of Nelson Rockefeller, but at this moment they were actually promised on display for Expo 1967 in Montreal. And so instead he deployed that photo mural that you see at the center um, of the image of the gallery. And as we explained, Darnancourt advised Nelson not just um, on non-Western art exhibitions, but I did also want to make a note that he advised him on modern art, uh, his modern art collection as well. And furthermore, he also provided installation guidance, such as with the bathers at Kaikit. Here you see on the left a drawing for um, it, the installation and as a, a photograph as it is finally installed. Darnancourt was planning to return to Pecanico to refine and finalize the plan with Nelson, but life events precluded that. 
Toward the end of his long and accomplished career, Darnancourt spoke with some frequency about the topic of installing shows. He concluded that, quote, the most important thing about installation is that preparing an exhibition is serving the artist. And an installation is no good if the installation impinges or becomes more important than the works of art, unquote. In fact, you, you might find it uh, in, of interest to learn that Darnancourt was so dedicated to the practice of exhibition design that he actually intended to write a book about it upon his retirement. And here is the news article announcing his retirement. Um, and you can see here, whoops, uh, his intention to write a book. Unfortunately, very tragically, just six weeks after he retired, he died when struck by an intoxicated driver while driving, while he was walking, um, taking an early morning stroll in Long Island. Nelson Rockefeller's biographer, Richard Norton Smith, wrote that Rene, on that early morning stroll, was actually on his way to the post office to mail a letter to Nelson. He continued um, in the biography to go to write that, quote, Rockefeller showed more emotion over the loss of Darnancourt than he had over his own failure to become president. Two days later, he fought back tears while delivering a graveside eulogy, unquote. I'd like to read uh, a brief excerpt of Nelson's eulogy and in doing so at the same time, I'd love to share with you these photos of of Rene on the left, uh, him at his 60th birthday party with his daughter, Anne, who went on to become the great museum director, and on the right with Nelson Rockefeller in the museum garden with other individuals. And as Nelson remarked at the eulogy, quote, love is the greatest force for good on earth, a force that binds people together. Rene Darnancourt was a man of love, who loved people, who loved beauty, who loved life. We are all here today because we loved Rene Darnancourt. It is indeed sad that one of the greatest spirits, one of the great human beings of our times should have been taken from this earth at the peak of his career as he was freed to inspire, to lead, to create. He brought joy to millions of people around the world and a cultural richness to this country, an American Renaissance. And two years later, the Museum of Primitive Art honored Darnancourt with a show devoted to his exhibitions on non-Western art. So those were Nelson's tributes to Rene, and now here is mine. Given that he was unable to realize his own book project, it is my hope that my published volume may serve as a testimonial and celebration of Darnancourt's pioneering work in the field of exhibition installations. So to conclude, Darnancourt himself recognized the conundrum of his avocation. He said, quote, installation is terribly dangerous. It's full of terribly seductive temptations. You mustn't just make things look desirable. Dramatization for its own sake must be avoided. Your job is to help the visitor see for himself and judge for himself what the object has to offer the power the guy has who does the installation. There is no such thing as a neutral installation. Installation is very complicated and exciting subject and it requires humility. Rene Darnancourt's autodidacticism, his unique background, his cosmopolitanism, his hum humility and humanity, his experiences in the mainstream of modern art, as well as as well as his devotion to the arts and artists at the peripheries, all combined to make him one of the most extraordinary museum professionals of the last century, a model for museum directors who followed him and an inspiration for us all in the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was so compelling and moving. Um, so I have a few questions that I prepared and then we will also take questions from our wonderful audience. Um, 
So my first question is, what was the most surprising or exciting discovery you made during the course of your research for the book? Oh, um, there were a couple of really fun discoveries. Um, I, I think one of the biggest discoveries for me was his work as a children's book illustrator. I think those illustrations are just so lovely. And I knew about some of the books and then I, I learned more. Um, and finally, there was one book that I, for some reason I had overlooked, uh, Beast, Bird and Fish. And one of um, Renee's relatives mentioned that to me. And so then I got my hands on a copy and it was when I was flipping through it that I found that page that I showed you where Renee is actually having a self portrait of him drawing. I think that's amazing. I also was, um, so thrilled and surprised to learn about his painting of the, the Morrow family's mural of the city of Cuernavaca. And what's so interesting there is that mural has subsequently been destroyed. So the image that I was able to share with you is actually from photo documentation that's retained in the Smith College archives. So that was like a, a really wonderful thing to find. Um, and then I think the last thing that was really interesting is Rene was always so modest. He, he specifically told people that he was not an artist. He's like, I'm not an artist, you know, I just dabble. And uh, well into the research for this book, we discovered that he actually had a solo show at Via Gallery in New York City. And he also had a couple of works included in a group show at the Cleveland Museum of Art. So, you know, if you're not an artist, I don't know what you're doing exhibiting at galleries and museums. True. Um, so, and thank you. Um, in your opinion, what about Rene Darnancourt's art installation philosophy has stood the test of time and what elements maybe not so much? Well, I, one thing that I found interesting about his work, particularly, I, I'm very drawn to the timeless aspects of modern art exhibition, just because that it resonates also with a lot of my interests. Um, but I think it's also relevant to today because I think we've seen a trend in the last several years of sort of this trans historical curating. Um, and I think he was in a way a, a forerunner of that. Um, certainly his interest in engaging with art and cultures outside of the Western sphere is completely relevant um, to today um, and trying to you know look and and learn and learn more about their context. I, I think that said, um, the way today we have um, evolved in our thinking about how we incorporate other narratives and other parts of the world in thinking about art and art history, um, you know, in a post-colonial perspective. I think if he were around today that there would be um, people suggesting that there be more, even more context provided, you know, not just to look th at things for the their aesthetic point of view. So it, it's, it's hard because he's kind of caught in the middle um, that he, 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 at his time, he was trying to elevate the aesthetic piece. But now I think in our perspective today that we would say, why don't we bring back a little more of the context and bring in a little more of the, the makers voices and the original creators um, cultural context. Absolutely. Um, and kind of related to that a little bit, um, how much did he engage with the indig indigenous peoples whose work he exhibited, if he did at all? Mm -hmm. um, well, it's, he had obviously two different approaches. So the ancient Andes folks, he couldn't, he it was not possible. Um, and the ASMAP populations, he had absolutely no engagement with. Uh, he was just working with Michael Rockefeller's collection. 
But um, with his exhibitions of Mexican art and the Indian art um, show, he uh, spent extensive time in Mexico um, traveling throughout the country and actually meeting with the various artisans to to not to not just collect, you know, this is also not someone going in and buying stuff and taking it out, but you know, learning about it, studying it, and borrowing it for exhibition, and also trying to come up with sort of a, a pipeline to help those communities self-sustain by producing more contemporary goods. And then with the Indian Arts and Crafts Bureau, he spent years traveling throughout the United States and actually meeting with individual tribes and nations. Now that said, I don't think that at the moment of the exhibition, they were directly involved, but he did have years of actually engaging with the, the various populations. That's great. Um, so, um, there are so many wonderful installation photos that you've included in the book and they're really fascinating and amazing to see. Um, and if we could go back in time to see one or even a few of the exhibitions that Darn and Court installed in person, which ones would you choose and why? Well, part of me would like to see the ancient arts of the Andes just because I read uh, one review of the show and the reviewer said, and you turn the corner and it was gold because they had all these golden objects and it just sounded so beautiful. Um, but if I had to choose one, it would probably be the, the Indian art show at MoMA in 1940. Um, from the installation, techniques point of view, like he used a different sort of approach on each of the three floors. So I think that's really interesting. I can't think of other shows that use very different approaches within a single exhibition. So that would be interesting to see. I also would like to see that um, opera ski uh, <laughs> suit in person. I didn't even know you're supposed to wear like something special for opera ski. Uh, but, you know, I really like sort of the the progressive politics of that, like to, to try again, to have this commercial bent. It, you know, this was the, like the time of the, the, the New Deal and, you know, it was really trying to get um, more financial resources into people's hands. And so I love that aspect of the show. Um, and I think it would have been really interesting to see the, um, the sand paintings that were created during the course of the show. And something that's really interesting to think about is the impact of that exhibition on later American um, abstract expressionist art. And it is well documented that Jackson Pollock visited this exhibition more than once. And if you just think about sort of the idea of creating on, uh, on a different plane, I, it's just fund them all over. Definitely. Um, we have a question from one of our audience members, Wendy Woon. She asks, what aspects of being an artist do you think uniquely added to Renee's leadership of, at Mo of MoMA? Well, I think I, I, the fact that he practiced, whether or not he called himself an artist, right? That's another matter. Um, but the fact that he himself created, I think that gave him a real appreciation when he did meet other artists or artisans. You know, there's a kinship, right? So it's different than coming at it from like a, a scholar point of view. Um, I also think What's so interesting about Darnancourt is, you know, he went from, you know, riches to rags, not quite rags. Art for him was a, a financial, uh, you know, it was a way for him to bolster his finances. It was a, his lifeline. It was his livelihood. And I think that is also a very different point of view than coming to being a museum director 
as just thinking about art in museums, which is a different, it's a no, more of elite, you know, versus this is art for every day for the masses. And I think that probably really informed his idea of thinking about the visitor's experience in looking at art in the, in the galleries. Definitely. And how he'd want to manage his museum, therefore, too. <laughs> Yeah, I think it, it gave him a greater sensitivity, I think, to the makers and to the objects themselves. Um, so now we have a question from another audience member, Cindy Capone. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing anyone's names. Um, she asked, at what age did you find your passion that led you to your career? And when did you first learn of Renee Darnancourt? Hmm. Okay. It's a long story. No, just kidding. Um, when I was in second grade, I wrote my very first report on the Great Pyramids of Giza. Um, okay, I'll try to fast forward. Uh, in college, I was uh, art history major, undergraduate, and I wanted to specialize in ancient art and uh, archaeology. Um, and I actually was ha very happy to, to win the our college's art history prize. And with that, I was able to go to the American School of Classical Studies in Athens uh, for a a session and so I was getting ready to start my career in archaeology and after this wonderful experience I love the country we visited 100 sites I came back home and I realized you know what ancient archaeology is not for me <laughs> fast forward I found out about a position at MoMA um, in the archives an archives fellow for research and I decided to, to take that. I always had an interest in modern art. And it's through my years in the archives that I actually realized that I think I've achieved what I was, I was seeking, what I set out to do, which is I'm, I, I'm still an archeologist. I'm just a modern day archeologist. And instead of looking at like pot sherds and digging in dirt and, you know, you know, off in the hot sun, I'm, you know, in a lovely archival repository going through boxes and looking at letters, diaries, photos, and trying to think about the sort of social history of what has come before us and, and why it's meaningful for us today. And as far as Darnancourt, um, he was known to me as early as when I started as a archives fellow, but I just thought he was a MoMA director. I didn't really think much about it. And then we started this project to process his papers um, up at the Rockefeller Archive Center. And since I was supervising that, I would meet with the archivist and review the work and then look at some of the materials. And when I saw those drawings, I, I was like, that's it. I was, that was the end of me. So I knew I had to do something, but it, it took a long time to get there, but I'm glad we, we did it. Yeah, that's wonderful. We're glad too, because now we have this <laughs> amazing book. Um, so another audience question, um, William Kasari, um, what was, do you think is the, was the biggest challenge for Darnancourt during his time at MoMA? And what could curators of today learn from his exhibitions? <laughs> probably his uh, biggest challenge was if you will like calming the troops just like interpersonal conflict um I think that's always been in the DNA at, at, at MoMA <laughs> it's sort of the po politics uh, you probably know you probably more than anyone else know Nelson Rockefeller's famous quote where he said everything I know about politics I learned at the Museum of Modern yes. Art <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think really Darnancourt was known to be the diplomat and to try to just get everyone to work together uh, well. Um, as far as what could people, curators, museum people learn from him today, I just, what I find so inspiring about him is his 
complete devotion in every single like individual object, like that very object specificity, I think is very interesting. Um, and, you know, he was never going into an exhibition like with some abstract, like totally abstract thesis. Like it was always very, very focused on the individual items. And, you know, I think it's also interesting to think about I like to think about him learning the art through sketching it. And honestly, I don't really know many museum people today that sketch out the objects that they're thinking about. And I just think that could be an interesting way of working. Sounds like fun too. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have time for about one or two more. Okay, thanks, Ellie. Um, so, this this book um, is a beautiful object. I was so thrilled when I accidentally kind of lifted up the jacket. Um, so everyone knows, everyone saw this jacket, but underneath we found that there are these wonderful um, character caricatures of Darnancourt that he drew one on the front and one on the back. Um, so that was such a wonderful detail. And I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the design of the book. Sure. Um, so the book was designed by uh, Miko McGinty. And I think she and her team did such an amazing job. Um, I knew she was right for for, for the project when we first met and I, I put out the drawings and her jaw just dropped. <laughs> so <laughs> she knew that it had to be a, a very like illustration centric book, right? The visuals are so key, but it's also hard to kind of get them laid out in the, you know, to correspond to the essays. Um, and there's also sort of three different elements. So getting all of that to work together um, was really an iterative process, but she, she did it beautifully. And I can't remember how it came up, but we were talking about the cover and we had those cute little drawings, which were both included in the, the slides. And she said, well, what if we were to, oh, you know what it was? I said, I, I had wanted like a, a pressed paper bound book. And the publisher said, well, we'll actually allow it to be cloth bound with a, a, a book jacket, you know? And I said, well, you know, I, I'm not such a fan about book jackets. They rip, right? They can get ratty. And, you know, there's a historically, not today, but historically the tradition in libraries is that you throw away the book cover, the, you know, wrapper. Um, and I said, you know, so I wouldn't want all of that to get lost. And then Miko said, oh, well, we could emboss those little drawings and it'll, it'll just be like a surprise treat for anyone who discovers it. So bravo to you for your discovery. Thanks. It, it, yeah, it definitely was a treat and it's been such a treat having you tonight. Thank you so much for your wonderful lecture and for answering our questions. And we're sorry to anyone we did not get to um, answer your questions, but we'll try to get back to you after the lecture. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm sorry we have to wrap up. I feel like we could keep going for a really long time, but um, we're gonna, we're gonna wrap up now. And on, the beh on behalf of everyone at the RVF, I wanna extend a huge thank you to Michelle. That was such a fascinating and enlightening and really touching and beautiful presentation. So thank you so much. And to Katrina for your wonderful job of moderating tonight's event. And thank you to everyone in the audience for coming. Please go to our website, rbf.org slash events for more info on upcoming programs. Be well, take care everyone, and we hope to see you soon. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Thank you.